so blessed to be a grandma. I don't know what you want. And you can hear me just. I don't know. Maybe this one. We'll try this. I'm not used to that because I don't normally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I feel better with the hand mic because I tend to move. And I'm afraid that my mind will go blank if I'm frozen and can't move. <laughs> yes, which is very easily, e very easily happens. Um, good morning, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Marie. And uh, I'm excited to have an opportunity to share some things that God has been sharing with me. And uh, I know that when God speaks to me, he's speaking to everybody because he's no respecter of persons. And if I have to be convicted, so do you. That's just the rule. It's probably an unwritten rule, but trust me, it's me. Uh, before I start, I want to open in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. We are constantly amazed. The sun shines. It gets up every morning because you told it to. And it goes to bed every night because you set the motion. There is no thing that ever happens in the entire universe and all the universes beyond the universes that you have not already established. You are so far greater than our minds can comprehend and we often bring you down to our level because that's all we understand. But you delight in breaking open our boxes and revealing who you are in greater ways to us. And you love watching our face light up just like we love watching our children and our grandchildren's eyes brighten when they understand a truth that they didn't get before. And I'm asking you, Father, this morning that you would help us to understand in a deeper way the things that we have heard multiple times again and again. Forgive us for the times we've become calloused and for the times that we have compromised and for the times that we have had excuses. Forgive us for the times, Father, that we have allowed our own understanding to become yours instead of remembering that our understanding is limited and yours is not. Forgive us, Father, for hearing and believing instead of seeking your face to know the truth. There's so many things that are taking place in our world right now, and you're not surprised by any of it. Before you put a star in the sky, Father, you knew our today. And if that doesn't build our faith and give us a confidence in who you are, I don't know what will. Because if you know my today and you're not worried, then I'm not going to be worried either. So I honor your name, Holy One. And I declare that you are good. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and open up our eyes today to see what we've been missing. Open up our understanding so that we can grasp the things we've had trouble understanding or that we thought that we did. And help us to see you in a whole new way and understand what a great, incredibly loving, kind God, Daddy, that you are. We bless your word, and I bless the people of God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so fun to talk to Daddy, isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story. This is a real story, and it happened to me yesterday. And I just love it because God had already put in my heart what he wanted me to be speaking about this morning, but he allowed something to happen yesterday that helped me to see and understand something a little bit better. 
and I had asked him because I thought it was really cool. You know, Tammy had her salad dressing example, and and I just thought, God, I need something to start this thing. You know, give me a joke or you know, how do I get started here? And and um, anyways, my husband and I a few weeks back decided to get our DNA tested. Our daughter, about six, eight months ago, had hers done, and she was like, oh, it's so much fun, and now I'm really curious, like, what are you, and what's dad, and, you know, wouldn't it be fun if the whole family did it, and she was just, and then she shared her results, and it was, it was, it was really fun. No, it's kind of expensive, but it was a bonding thing, <laughs> and it was fun, and it made me really curious with her results. So, a couple weeks ago, my husband and I did this. Now, his went into the lab first. I'm not sure why, because I always think ladies should be first. But apparently, the lab tech thought that the man should be the one that leads the way. He must know God. So, his results came back. I haven't gotten mine back yet. I'm waiting. His stuff went in the lab, and they give me this little email, you're you know, Tim's whatever DNA is now in the lab, and you should get results soon. And then a couple days later, I got my notice. So I figure mine's coming. It's just not yet. So I'm reading this DNA result, and I started howling. I mean, I was laughing so hard I was crying because it so took me by surprise. I said, oh, God. I can't wait to tell my husband. He is not going to believe this. And you know what he said? <laughs> he said, well, how accurate is those DNA tests? <laughs> That's how unexpected. The d and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's a DNA test. <laughs> Unless they mix you up with somebody else. This is yours, honey. You just grab it and claim it, you know. <laughs> so I don't know about you guys personally. I grew up with a father who was very proud of our heritage. And his dad came over on a boat and went through Ellis Island, and we had our, he had his name changed. And he is French. My father's French. You ever question that, he will make it very clear to you, I am French. Because my father came from Ellis, through Ellis Island, he's from France, the bloodline is what chooses what you're going to be, and so... I am French. Now, you know, I know mom had a little, you know, English, maybe Irish or something. I don't know. She had stuff in her, but I am French. That's what my dad would say. So that's what I heard all of my life was, you're French. But my mother would say, but I'm 100% Norwegian. Now, my grandfather's name was Olaf. My grandmother's name was Olga we're probably Norwegian. So then my mom and dad would get into this little discussion <laughs> about, well, they're only French. And my mom would say, ah, ah, I carry these babies. They got me in them too. There's also Norwegian in there. And they would go back and forth, and they would just laugh about it. It was a big joke. So I grew up with the understanding that I am French and Norwegian with maybe a little bit of English or Irish. What am I? I don't know. But I am really curious now. <laughs> because my husband's name is Harkle Road. It's about as German as you get. This is what they tell me. My father's mother was a McFarlane. You don't get so much more Irish than that, right? So we've got, a, we've got German and Irish with probably a little mix here and there, but hey, this is what it is. So do you know how much German my husband has in him? I kid you not, zero. <laughs> zero. Like, nada. <laughs> and I'm reading this. I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> There's no German in him at all. Now, it doesn't mean that Harkle Road isn't a German name. And it doesn't mean that his father doesn't have German in him. But God is the one who decides who we take after. Have you ever noticed? Like, my husband's family, there's six kids. And when you look at them, you can say, he takes after dad, she takes after dad, 
and he takes after dad, but oh my goodness, these three boys, they take, a, take after mom. Well, my husband takes after his mom. So that would make sense that his DNA would not take after his dad, but that his DNA probably took after his mother, which was very high in English and some Irish, because that's what she was and her mixes of whatever. Because we don't all have, you know, it's not like my husband and I, uh, my DNA splits half and half and everything in my husband splits half and half and that's what our kids all have because they're going to go. And honestly, I was never good at this in school, so I only know this much of what I'm talking about. And so if you know what I'm talking about, you're probably sitting there going, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And you would be right. But what I do know is that my husband is a Harker Road and he doesn't have German in him and I think that's hysterical. <laughs> he does, though, have Italian. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> he has from that area of Spain and Portugal. <laughs> and he's like, what? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't do the test. <laughs> this is yours. And what God started showing me was, we all have DNA. That's how God created us. But we also have a spiritual DNA. Because we were created in the image of Christ. And God, the image of God, okay? And God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one, so I guess I could pick any of the names or I could mention all three, but the point is we were created like God, to be like God. We are not God. We do not have the power of God, the knowledge of God, the infiniteness of God, no, but we have character traits of God, and that's what DNA is. It's our character traits that comes from our generations. And the Lord said to me, one of my characteristics is righteousness. Now, that's what I was going to be talking about this morning. So that was already established. But he said to me, righteousness is one of my characteristics. Is it in your DNA? That made me stop and think, like, I hope. And how would I know unless I am really watching what I think, and I'm really watching what I do, and I'm really watching my attitudes, and I'm really seeking the heart of God so that it can be imparted into me. The righteousness of God is an incredible thing, and we need it, because if we're going to represent God, we need to have righteousness as a part of our DNA. How many times have you heard somebody say, wow, look at Joe Schmo, he looks just like his dad the older he gets. Well, I believe as believers, the older we get in Christ, the more we should look like our father. Our, our attitudes and the way that we work and the way that we think and the way that we speak and the way that we talk to him even should be different. Because I'm going to tell you right now, my children, when they see them, they don't talk to me like they did when they were little. They don't call me mum, 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 mum anymore. When they did, it was awesome, and I loved it. But if they did that when they were 10, I'd say, what are you doing? Grow up. Good grief. I'm your mother. And don't call me mother, because that sounds harsh. Call me mom. <laughs> Just one mom, not mum, 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 mum. Right? And now my kids, they'll say, hey, mom. Can we da, 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 and then they start talking about their jobs, and it's an in, in, uh, intelligent conversation. They didn't have those conversations when they were three. You say, come here, your shoe's untied. Mommy, show you how to do it again. Are you hungry? No, 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 you can't have that yet. I don't do that to my children now. If I did, it would be ludicrous. So as a believer, how do I talk to my Father in heaven? And when he talks to me, how much do I understand? Because if I told my five-year-old, listen, I, you know, when you're 16 or so, you're going to be learning how to drive a car. So I want you to understand this is the engine, and this is the transmission, and this is the key. And when you put it in the car, this starts running, and that starts happening. And you have to be careful. You don't want the tires too low because then they'll wear them out. You'll wear them out too quickly, and then you're going to have to buy new ones, and they cost a lot of money. And, you know, you don't have that kind of money right now. I'm not going to talk to my five-year-old like that. But I'd talk to my 16-year-old like that. 
and you better not be racing down the road, and you better not be, and all the other things we say. There should be a difference in how I communicate to my Father in heaven and how he communicates with me, and there should be a difference in how I communicate with you and how you communicate with me. Because we represent Jesus, and we are not infants in the Lord. But if we come across a new believer, we should take that into consideration. They may not have all of their theology right. They may not fully understand some things. And they might have some knowledge that you don't have because their passion has touched a heart of the Father that maybe yours hasn't because maybe you don't have that passion there. Because we all have something to give to one another. So the question that I'm asking you is the same one he asked me because he's no respecter of persons, and that is righteousness. Is it in your DNA? Do you look more and more like your father as you grow up? So I'm going to get out my notes. And uh, I want to start with a few negatives. They say you should never, who's they? I don't know. But somebody says you shouldn't end on a negative. You should always end on a positive. So I want to start with a negative so I can end on a positive. And it's not a negative. And this is the thing. Just even saying it, I'm reminded that this is how we often view things. When God says don't do this, we think of it as a negative. But it's actually positive because if we don't do it, then it's good. <laughs> it's a warning. It's, a, it's, a, it's an FYI. God gives us a lot of FYIs. Oh, by the way, if you don't seek me, then you will not find me. Is that a duh? Yeah, okay. So if you find me, you will. If you seek me, you will find me. That's a positive. But those are all FYIs. It's not a punishment. It's a fact. If you throw seed into the ground and you know you're throwing corn, then you're going to get corn, and you're not going to be surprised when wheat shows up because you already know what corn seeds look like. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's a fact. So when you reap what you sow, it's a fact. You sow to good, you get good. You sow to bad, you get bad. It's a fact. It's not a negative. It's not a positive. So I just wanted to clarify all that for you because I thought I would. So in Proverbs, let me find it here. Proverbs 24, 11 says that the, the righteous fall seven times, but they get back up again. So first of all, that's a fact. If you fall and you get back up again and you keep going, God calls you righteous. But God, I always blow this. God says, if you get back up again, you're righteous. I'm not going to try anymore. I give up and get back up again, what are you called? When we fall, we often don't want to get back up because there are things that we mess up on in our life and we do over and 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 And we start feeling like, God, I'm never going to get this part right. I'm trying not to get angry, but every time they do that, every time they do it, I feel a little angry. I try not to get angry. And I we do this over and over and over and over. Oh, why did I keep talking? I kept telling my mouth to shut up, but it didn't listen to me. And I always say things that I end up my big old foot stuck in my big old mouth. Over and over and over. And why did I spend that money there? I know I didn't have the money to spend there. And all the time spending on my credit cards looking like I shouldn't. And I don't want to keep making these mistakes over and over and over. And 
oh my goodness, I know I need to spend more time with my children, but it's so hard. And when I'm with them and they're wanting my attention, I'm always pushing them off and pushing off. And I know I shouldn't do that. And I don't want to do this, but I keep doing it over and over and over. And I don't want to be a complainer. I hate being a complainer. Every time I complain, I hear myself speaking and I'm thinking, why am I always saying negative things? I don't want to say negative things, but I keep doing it over and over and over. There are things that we make choices of and we don't want to, and we fall into this rut, and we do it over and over, and we feel like, I ought to just give up. But God says, the righteous get back up again. You know why? It's not because we're dumb. It's not because we're, we are gluttons for punishment. It's because we know our God is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we ask. And he is our grace. And he is our hope. And he is our salvation. And I am not putting my confidence in me who falls over and over. I'm putting my confidence in my God who is faithful to me even though I fall over and over and over. And that makes me want to love him more. Because what, what kind of a God is this that loves us that much? And then, you know, the real kicker, and this gets me I, every time. It really does. God, I'm here again. I screwed up again. I am so sorry. I don't know why you keep forgiving me. God, please forgive me. And he says, what are you talking about? I forgave you the last time. You ask, I forgive. I don't even remember it anymore. To him, I'm not falling over and over and over and over again. It's only once. And if I can get that into my head, it would sure make me run to him quicker when I fall. It would make me want to be like those, um, what are those people called? It's a new thing that's out there. It's not karate and stuff. It's poker or poo. poo. Oh, this is so ridiculous. Nobody knows. Nobody's helping me here. I don't remember the name. But whatever it is, it's like they, they run and they fall and they roll and they're up again. I mean, it's like all in one move. It's cr incredible. I've seen it on TV and I'm like, what are they doing? I mean, they run up walls. I'm not kidding you. They'll run up the wall and flip and fall. I always thought those were just, you know, TV stunts that people did with help with invisible belts and stuff. But these people really do it. It's crazy. But that's how God wants us to be, active and quick and ready, ready. And when we're walking in the righteousness of Christ Jesus, we're ready. Righteousness is a vital part of the kingdom of God. And what I love so much is it's also part of our armor. That's how vital being righteous before God. And do you know what righteousness is? Righteous means to be in right standing with God. It's not real deep and profound, but I'll tell you what, it's dandy to stay there <laughs> because life is pulling at us left and right. But for me to be in a position before my God where I'm in right standing, where I am doing what he wants me to do the way that he wants me to do it, I am then walking in the righteousness of Christ. Now, there is a verse Sorry, I'm not used to this thing. Um, and I wrote it down because I never can remember where it's found. Ah, Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that our own righteousness is like a filthy rag. It's like a polluted garment. What I do outside of God in God's eyes, is dirty, filthy guck. And it reminded me of 1 Corinthians 13, where it says that without love, what you do is, has no value to it. In fact, it's as loud, noisy, annoying, nail on the chalkboard, screeching, ugh, in God's ears. So it's, it's the same idea. Anything that we do in of ourself is not, does not have value at all. But it's not just not valuable. It's disgusting. 
It's foul. It's something that is like a stench that rises to the heavens. And so we need to remember that just because I do something good doesn't mean it has value. But when I am doing what I know God has called me to do, that has great value because that is the righteousness of, of God. And I gain that through Christ Jesus. John 9.31 tells us that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he hears those who worship him and do his will. Now, he's not referring to the lost. He's talking about people who claim to be a Christian, but they live their own way. Because anytime a sinner cries out to God because they want to know God, God will hear them and he will answer. That's how we all got saved or nobody would ever be saved. <laughs> Nobody's born a Christian. <laughs> We're born again, we get new DNA, right? We now have the DNA of Christ. So what we need to remember is that when we're walking our own way, we're not pursuing the things of God. We're not spending time with God. I don't want to hear what he has to say because I really want to hear what this newscaster has to say. And I don't really want to take the time to stop and read the word because I've heard it enough. And besides on Sundays, they always blah, 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 the word. I got the word. I know the word. I know God. He saved me. I'm good. God does not hear your prayers if you're not doing what he's asked you to do. That's a hard word. That's like an arrow. All those prayers that I prayed because I wanted my own way, because I was praying from my own understanding and I didn't really follow what God was saying to me, because he told me to go here and I went there, because he told me to stop and I kept going. I don't care. God's God, and I need him, and on Sundays, I, I sing, and I listen, and then I go home. There is a difference between a true believer who has given himself to Christ and somebody who just doesn't want to go to hell. And I believe that God in these last days is bringing greater understanding to his people who don't get that it's not about it is about life and death and hell and heaven, but that's not his purposes. His purposes is our relationship with him. He longs for us. Have you ever waited for your child to call and you think, oh, it's getting late and they haven't called me yet? They never miss my birthday. They never miss a holiday. Or I haven't talked to them for months and I left them three messages. And you just want to talk to them because you miss them and because you love them. And that's what God's heart is for us. It's not do this and I'll do that because that's the right thing to do. It's love me because I love you. And as we have fellowship, I'll tell you what I have for you and then just do it. And you're going to be wowed by the things I allow you to do in my name. And you're going to be excited because the adventure is grand. There are things that God has for his people that go so far beyond what we understand because we haven't pursued him. But he says, I have secrets, and I love to tell them to my friends. When's the last time God whispered a secret in your ear? I'll tell you what, I'm saying these things because I've been provoked. My God, you haven't told me any secrets for a little while, and I'd kind of like to hear some because when I'm not hearing them, I know that there's something that I am missing because he would never stop. He never stops. He never stops. But I do. I get caught up in my everyday life. Is it bad stuff? No, it's just busy, and it's just my job and my family and my house and my, 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 my. And God says, okay, and these things are life, and we do them. But if I don't get in that time with the Lord so that I can hear what he has for me that day, then how can I ever do the things Jesus did? That's how he found out. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. How did he see that? He spent time with the Father. And then he said, greater things than Jesus did, we'll be able to do. But how can I do it without the Father when Jesus needed the Father? How much more do I need the Father? It's all about relationship. And that's the thing that I really believe God wants us to understand. Our righteousness is gucky. His righteousness is it's perfect, and it's beautiful, and it accomplishes what he sends it forth to do. 
the one of the scriptures that um, Annette touched on a couple weeks back was how the prayer, the consistent, the fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes a lot. It does what it's supposed to do, depending on your uh, translation. Elijah was only a man, he's only human, like we're human. He didn't. Ha he wasn't born some supernatural thing that was a section out of God that all of a sudden could do things. No, he was a normal human being, but he walked in righteousness. He was in right standing. Him and God, they were like that. They were good. And because of that, he knew when to pray, he knew how to pray, and he knew what to to pray. God said it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Didn't rain for three and a half years. God said now it's time to pray. He didn't say okay three and a half years is up. I'm going to send rain. No. He said now I want you to start praying for it and I want you to start looking for it. That was God's that's what God told him to do. So he prayed. He sent a servant, go see if things happen, and nope. Oh, I must have missed God. I know that for sure he told me to pray. I wonder why nothing's happening. Well, I'll do it again tomorrow. That's not what he did. He prayed some more because he knew God had told him to do it, and God doesn't tell us to do something unless God's going to do something with it. So he prayed again. And then he sent a servant again. And the servant says, well, you know, I see this little tiny cloud starting to form about the size of a man's hand. I mean, see this little bitsy thing down there, you know? He didn't say, hmm, maybe I should go back to God and ask him if I heard him right. This doesn't make any sense. I thought he told me I was supposed to pray. No, he just got back down and he just prayed again. He knew his God. He knew his God's voice. He knew God told him to do it. He did it. And he didn't stop doing it until God gave the answer. And I love this because when the cloud started to get big, he didn't wait for the rain. He knew it was time to start running back. And I love because God gave him supernatural strength that he actually ran faster than the chariot. He beat the chariot home. Wouldn't that be cool? I would love to beat my husband home. He can get his truck and drive home, and I'd greet him at the door. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Nobody would believe that one. <laughs> but the righteousness of God, when we are in it, things happen. And sometimes I think we, as the body of Christ, and I can speak from experience, we get weary of well-doing because we don't get the results we think we should get. We get tired of the battle, and we think it should be ending, and it hasn't yet, and we don't know why, and we just <sighs> don't want to fight anymore. But the righteous man seeks God and says, what do I do? How much do I do? When do I do? And then thanks God for the results. So one of the things that I think are really, really cool is that God has given us armor. And the armor of God, I, I remember one time I was talking to a pastor years ago, and I said, before my kids go to school, we always, you know, I pray for them, and they always put on their armor, and I make them say it so that they're aware. I mean, they literally would, I would make them do this, because a visual, being an active part of something, you remember it better, and it's more aware, you're more aware you did it. So I would make them put on their, arm, their helmet of salvation. Let's say, put on your helmet of salvation. There you put it on. What did you just do? I put on my helmet of salvation. What does that mean? It means that I am saved, and this is covering my ears so that I will only listen to God, and I don't hear what everybody else is saying because God's right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> like, okay, let's put on the next thing. Let's put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? means that I have to obey my teachers and I have to do all the rules that we do at home even though I'm not there and you're not there to tell me that I can't do it because I have to be doing what is right so I have on the righteousness of God. Let's put on the belt of truth. They would put on their belt. Now what are you doing? 
I'm putting on the belt of truth because the belt of truth means that it protects my belly so I don't get sucker punched and I have to always tell the truth. Very good. Now, put on the shoes of peace. They put on their shoes. What did you just do? I put on my shoes of peace because everywhere I go, I am supposed to be carrying the peace of God because I'm a Christian. Very good. Now, tell me, what's going to happen when your teacher tells you you are not allowed to get out of your chair until a certain time and you do it because you want to because you just really need to get out of that chair for whatever reason you have to get out of the chair. And she just doesn't understand you need to get out of that chair. So you just get up and you just get out of that chair anyway. What happens? My breastplate falls off. <laughs> I'm like, that's right. Now what's going to protect your heart? I don't know. Okay, remember that's what this is for. It protects our heart. It protects our ribs. We need to wear righteousness. What happens if your friend says to you that his sister can run faster than your sister? Are you going to say, well, my sister runs faster than yours? I get, you know, I mean, get shrugs, right? Don't you love when your kids answer you with their shoulders? I said, well, let me tell you what happens. You might be tempted to say, uh-uh, my sister's bigger, and she can run much faster than your sister can. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my mom. Now, if you do that, do you know what's going to happen? That belt of truth is going to fall right off of you. And then the enemy can come up and he can punch you all he wants right in that belly and you're not going to be able to stop him because you have no protection now. Do you know why? Because you did not tell the truth. And what are you going to do if that thing falls off? I'm going to pray. Yes. And you're going to ask God to forgive you for what you did. And then you're going to ask the person that you lied to to forgive you for what you did. And then you know what happens? All by itself, that belt of truth goes whoosh, right back on you. It is so important that we as believers understand the armor of God is to protect us. And we talk about the armor of God. And some of us can quote that whole section. And it's awesome because you should know it that well. But how many of us actually think about it? How many of us actually think about when I do not do what is right, that part that is supposed to be protecting me is no longer there to protect me? And then I get my heart hurt, or I get kicked in the rib, and now it hurts. I'm hurting, God. How come you let this happen? Oops. Did God let it happen? Yeah, because everything comes through God. Did God purpose you to be hurt? What if you would have done the right thing and had your breastplate on? Would you have been hurt? You might have felt a little, ooh. You go, yeah, that's why I got my breastplate righteousness on, because I'm prepared. God gave us everything we need for life and godliness. He gave it to us, and he said, use it. And when you use it, you aren't going to find that the battle is so exhausting. He gives us a shield of faith. The shield of faith is supposed to extinguish every fiery dart extinguish every fiery dart. So when the enemy sends something out your way, where is your shield? Because I guarantee you, you see that baby coming your way, you can't say, well, time out. <laughs> I got to go in my bedroom. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot my shield. <laughs> Just hang on there a second. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The enemy is, he's nasty. And he knows the weapons that can take us out. And we have to be aware that God has given us what we need to stand and fight. We need those things. And when that fiery dart comes my way and my shield of faith comes up, the dart hits the shield, not me. It doesn't have any access to my being. It can't puncture. It can't wound. 
It can't cause an irritation that's going to start to fester and cause me all kinds of issues that I have to go through years of counseling for. It's meant to protect us. God says, I have given you what you need. You need to use it. And then he didn't just say, okay, I'm going to leave you on the offense. And you use all that stuff right, you would never get hurt. Uh-uh. He gave us the word of God. It's our weapon. So that the enemy doesn't keep hitting us and hitting us. Have you ever watched? My dad loved boxing. My, my, I don't know. People love boxing, and that's okay. That's their business. I don't get it. I'm just grateful I don't have to watch it because I don't like it. And this guy, you know, he'll be going, and he's protecting all of his vitals. He's protecting everything, but he's not punching back. He's like a punching bag. Now, even if you're fully armored, how much do you want? I mean, how far do you get in life if you're like this all the time? I'm coming. Just I can't talk to you right now. Tell them they have to wait. I can't stop. I can't move. I'm protecting myself. That is useless if you don't also have this, the word of truth. There are a whole lot of facts out there right now, folks. But do they line up to the truth of what God says? God's given us a weapon, and it is a defensive, what, defensive, offense. Am I getting those backwards? Offensive, defensive. If you're on the defense, you're being aggressive, and if you're on the offense, you're protecting, right? Okay, I'm so sorry. That's the opposite. Everything I just said, just flip it. So he gives us a weapon so we can go after the enemy. We don't have to be punching bags. The body of Christ has to walk upright. We have to love those that are not lovable. We have to turn the other cheek when somebody hits us. We have to forgive constantly because there's always something to forgive. And I hope that people do forgive me constantly because, oh, my goodness, do I have a lot to forgive. So I should be forgiving others, right? I mean, seriously. Just think about it. I should be on my way to hell right now. If you want to know why God isn't fair, you can be very grateful he's not. Because if God was fair, we'd all be going to hell. Because we all deserve it. But God is gracious and he's loving. And he has a plan for our life. And it is not hell. It is not eking through our life. It is to be a bold believer who goes forward, fully armed, with the weapon, to push back the darkness, to push back the darkness. How much darkness have you been pushing back? Don't ask me that question, because that would be embarrassing right now. Because I forget. I forget. You forget, right? We forget that we are not the ones who are the tail. We are the head. We are the ones that prepare the way. We are the ones that push back darkness because we are of the kingdom of light. And if we turn off all the lights in the middle of the night, and you live where we live in the middle of nowhere, and there aren't any artificial lights anywhere, there's the sun and the stars and the moon, and that's your light unless you have electricity. So you turn everything off, it's dark. You put on a little light. You, you can flick your bick. <laughs> Just a little light. And man, does it change things, doesn't it? You can see what you couldn't see before because light dispels the darkness. That little flicker of light, it didn't have to fight to bring light. It is light. And darkness can't dwell in the light. And if we are the children of light, if we are children of God and God is light, if Jesus is the light of the world and that light dwells in us, then that light should be dispelling the darkness all by itself because when I walk in a room, the light of Jesus should be shining out. When the room is in turmoil, I should walk in and that should make a difference. The darkness should automatically go like this when we walk in a room. It should be back and way up. What happens if you get two bicks flicking? The darkness goes back further. What if you get 12 
little lights going. The darkness goes back even further. The reason is because the darkness can't dwell in the light. And when we as believers gather together, how many are we? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. That's a lot of light. There should be no darkness in this room. There should be no darkness in the surrounding area here. If we are letting our light shine for Jesus Christ, then there isn't a lot of fighting that we have to do, is there? What we battle is that the enemy is trying to put a bushel over our light. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, if we keep in right standing with him and let the righteousness of God prevail, then our answers that of prayer that we are praying for will start coming in quicker. We're going to start seeing a difference. And everything that God is saying, I love what God is saying. God talked to me about this in September when I was on my vacation. And then I come in, and, and Annette, she's talking about fasting and prayer, which is one of the things we talked about on our vacation. And about where are we in this, and why aren't we in this, and when are we in this, and how are we in this, and how much should we be in this, and what are we like when we're in this. And then Tammy talked about prayer taking that further. And, and this is all about the armor of God. It's about righteousness because after you go through the armor of God section, it talks about prayer and that we are to pray in all manner of prayers. All manner. It's not wrong to ask God for a need. He says, ask me if you have a need. You don't have because you don't ask. And if you ask, you don't believe you're getting it anyway. Well, gee, there's an eye opener. So I have to believe when I ask, right? So what I believe God wants us to remember is that we are in dark times. But our light will dispel the darkness. Our prayers, when we are walking in obedience, when we are quick to respond, when God says, you shouldn't have said that. God, I'm sorry, you're right. Please forgive me. That's a quick response. That's, that's like, okay, I turned over here. Whoop, I'm coming back over here now. You need to get a grip of that anger or you're going to end up saying things you don't want to say. Oh, God, sorry. But you know, they really need it and they, they deserve it. And besides, you don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, God. Whew. A whole lot of stuff can be spared if we just kept quick in our repentance. Quick. Because then we can hear God clearly. We can hear him clearly. We can see what he's doing. And then we know what to do. Now, I've been listening a lot to the prophets lately. I stopped doing it for, in fact, I never really did it a whole lot. I did some, but lately God has got me listening to a lot of prophets, and they're all saying the same thing. The church is time for them to rise up. They're saying it is time that we begin to seek God in prayer and fasting. They're saying that there's a lot of things that can change in this country and in the world if God's people would humble themselves if God's people would pray, if they would seek his face, if they would turn from their wicked ways. There is so much that God has for America and for the world. He wants, it is not his will that any perish, but all, everyone come to the full knowledge of Christ. Well, what about that woman, that old head of the house speaker? I mean, no. He loves her. He died for her. Don't be putting your mouth against her. Pray for her salvation. Well, I know, but those people over there that they want, you know, they want babies dead. Yes, they do, and they're in sin. And they need Jesus, or they're going to die and go to hell. Don't put your mouth against them. Prophesy into them. In the name of Jesus, I call you into the salvation of Jesus Christ. I release the revelation of salvation into your life that you will begin to know and understand that there is righteousness, sin, and judgment, and it's coming to your house, but God has made a way for you to be saved. Well, I don't know, you know, the election's looking pretty crazy, and you got all these people doing all these bad things. Don't put your mouth on it. Speak life so that you and your children can live. Them and their children can live. Speak salvation to the hearts that are not serving God. Speak revelation to people who know him, but they're not getting it. 
Jesus said, pray that the blinders that are on the eyes of people will be unveiled, that will be removed. Jesus said, pray the scales fall off their eyes. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened so that you would understand, that you would see what you're missing. I was listening to this woman. She has a, a CD on how to raise uh, children who live in the supernatural realm. This is such a good CD. And she's from England. She has this really cool accent. <laughs> I just really enjoyed listening to her. But she said she taught her children this very simple thought. She said, they said, Mommy, I can't get this map, and I'll never get this map, and Jesus isn't helping me get this map, and I prayed, and he's not helping me, and I don't know what to do, and it's not working. And she said, well, where was Jesus in the room when you were taking that test? And this child said, he was locked up in my pencil case. And she said, when she said that, God gave her a, a, like a, a revelation. She says, no, 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 wait a minute. Where was Jesus, and where was he in the room when you were taking your test? I don't know. He doesn't care about anything. I ask him all about these tests, and you know I can't do really good with these tests. And I, I, I just telling you right now, Mommy, he was just locked up in my pencil case. He doesn't care. She says, you listen to me. I want you to stop, and I want you to think, and then I want you to tell me, where was Jesus in the room when you were taking your test? And she said, all of a sudden, her daughter's eyes lit up, and she went, <gasps> Mommy, he was sitting in my chair, and I was sitting on his lap. And she said, God began to tell her, you need to train your children to look for Jesus in the room. He's there. It's because we don't see him with our natural eyes. doesn't mean we can't learn to see in the spiritual realm. We should be living in the spiritual realms. We are not children of this world. We are, we are the DNA of God. What's going on? That's how Jesus knew what to do. He saw what was happening in the spirit realm. He knew when somebody needed healed because they were blind. And he knew when someone needed delivered from a demon because they were blind. How did he know the difference? Oh, he was Jesus. No, he only did what he saw the Father doing. He was looking in the spirit realm, and he knew what needed to happen for that person to be delivered or healed. And if we start looking for Jesus in every situation, every conversation, where is he at work? Where is he in your home? What kind of a relationship does Jesus want with you? He wants a friendship, bestie, bestie. He, he's already allowed us to break his heart, and he gave us a part of his, and it says BFF. That's what our Jesus is like. So I want to encourage you today, get your heart before the Lord and ask him to show you, where am I missing it, God? Because I don't want anything to keep me from you. And if there is anything that I am not doing that you've asked me to do, please forgive me and show me and help me so that I can be in right standing with you. I can speak the truth. I can disperse the darkness. And I can see what Jesus is doing. And I can step in. And I will also do the same thing that Jesus did when he walked on the earth. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. God is doing an awesome thing. You are the light of the world because Jesus is in you. And if he's the light everywhere he goes is light. So just seek him and ask him to show you where you're missing it so that you can line back up because that's all it is. It's not a rebuke. It's not a, it's not a condemnation. It's not, oh, woe is me. It's just like, oh, you mean if I put eggs in that cake, it'll rise better? Well, then I'm putting eggs in the cake. It's an FYI. God says, do my way, do my work my way, and it will happen. It's just the way it is. And we get to do that because we're his children. So, Father, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for adjusting us. I thank you for envisioning us. But mostly I thank you that when you look at me, 
you get so excited that you spin around violently shouting in joy. What kind of a love is that? I want that for you, Lord. And because you are no respecter of person, and everyone in this room is in the same boat as I am, when you look at them, you just shout in joy, and you spin around violently rejoicing because they are your child. They are your friend. They, you just love them. You just love them. They are your beloved. And we all want to see you the same way. So help us to learn how to walk in a way that is in right standing with you so that we are not ever help, uh, put to shame when others say to us, well, if you're a Christian, why did you do that? Why did you say that? No. They're going to say, well, you must be a believer because I see something different in you. And that's where you're taking us, Father. And I thank you. And I just bless this congregation, everyone here. I bless them all in the name of Jesus. I bless everyone who is listening in the name of Jesus. And I, I just ask, Father, that you would heal what is sick and you would fix what is broken and you would release those things that have held us back from running the race with perseverance. I ask that you would help your word to come to life in our understanding so that we can walk it out in our everyday life, that you would draw us in with your cords of kindness so that we would be so intimately tied with you that to speak the very name of Jesus brings a smile to our face and causes our heart to leap. I thank you that even though this world is a mess right now, you have a plan, and we are part of the answer. So help us to speak your life, your heart, and your ways in love and in righteousness. Help us to see what you see and to call back those who have walked away from the Lord into the kingdom in prayer. Help us to love them physically, but to pray for them and to retrieve them in the spirit realm. Let our light so shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father that is in heaven. This is our prayer, Father, and we thank you because it's your heart to bring it to pass. In Jesus' name, amen.